Questions to the Minister. My apologies to the two members I could not call, but we do have to move on to our short debate, uh, which is a debate on motion number 11386 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Town Centre Action Plan one year on. And I'll just give a few seconds for members to change their seats. I now call Derek Mackay to speak to move the motion. Minister, 10 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's apt that I'm here hot in the heels of the Historic Environment Scotland Bill debate, given the important role of historic buildings and conservation areas in many of our town centres. There is huge crossover between the two items, and I have no doubt that the new body proposed will be well positioned alongside key partners to help make the most of the opportunities to promote both. It is already a year since I launched the Town Centre Action Plan in Kilmarnock, and yesterday we uploaded a one-year-on report onto our website. It provides a useful snapshot of key progress against each of the key themes in the plan. One year on, this report is evidence of the significant activity being undertaken cross-government and with wider partners on a consensual basis. I'm also pleased to witness evidence of a growing engagement from councils, communities and businesses across Scotland working towards the revitalisation of our town centres. The action plan sets out our strategic response to the key themes identified by the external advisory group who undertook the town centre review. It clearly shows where we need to align our main functions and policies in order to create the necessary conditions to support local vision and local delivery. Since last November, I have taken a direct hand in ensuring that colleagues and senior officials across government have been kept informed and fully engaged in the delivery of the action plan. I have met with local authorities, community groups and business representatives, and I am encouraged by what I have seen underway. There is, of course, still much to be done, and I am here today for two reasons – to set out what we have achieved and to take your views on where we need to go next in terms of the ongoing action plan delivery. I responded to your call to address the proliferation of PD lending shops in our town centres by hosting a summit in April which led to the publication of a 12-point plan. Working with industry and local authorities, this includes measures to improve availability of financial education and money advice, as well as test case planning pilots and authorities most impacted by clustering issues. I am also pleased that the Competition and Markets Authority have concluded their investigation into the PD loan market. We welcome their final report announcing measures which include the introduction of a comparison website and greater transparency on fees and charges. The Town Centre First Principle was agreed by Cabinet on the 24th of June and announced jointly with COSLA on the 9th of July. It was the main ask from the National Review. It calls on central government, local authorities, communities and the wider public sector to put town centres at the heart of proportionate and best value decision making. Agreement to this principle marks a significant shift in public policy and is further testament to the raised profile of town centres across all sectors. Uh, less high profile but vitally important in practice, the Scottish Public Finance Manual, which guides public bodies on both acquisition and disposal of their assets, was revised, of course. Gavin Brown. I'm grateful to the Minister. I think we welcome the Town Centre First Principle. What impact would that have had if it had been in place, though, at the time of the court closure programme? Well, to say, but it, it would certainly have been a consideration in that programme, maybe in a way that town centres were not, because this requires, as a matter of policy and guidance, the consideration of town centres in any asset and service uh, decision. But it, it will be one of many material considerations that could be taken into account. And I understand the members' concerns uh, about uh, those buildings, but there are also opportunities in the ongoing use of these buildings for community and other groups uh, going forward that can generate a footfall. So these policies put in place, guidance around the, as I say, acquisition and disposal of assets, and it makes it an in principle consideration when making those decisions going forward. Similarly, the equivalent within the NHS will also be updated in due course. And as well as these uh, revisions in the new Scottish planning policy published in June, we reflect the principle in broadening out of the town centre first approach to plan for a broader range of uses which attract significant number of people to their towns. 
In practice, local authorities and public sector bodies are encouraged to demonstrate their commitment to their town centres by acknowledging the principle and applying this when making investment decisions within town centres. Uh, local authorities I would name check include East Ayrshire, East Remshire, Clackmannanshire and West Dumbartonshire for different but related uh, reasons. On town centre living, not only will the town centre housing fund see empty town centre properties brought back into use in seven local authority areas, significant funding from the affordable housing supply programme is also helping to provide more affordable homes and town centres across Scotland. On the 18th of November, we'll host a one-day Scottish housing event, bringing together over 300 stakeholders to help share a five-year collaborative housing action plan for Scotland, focusing on the delivery of current housing strategies, and as part of that, town centres will be a priority. We are absolutely committed to supporting the right conditions for flourishing businesses and entrepreneurs across Scotland. I am delighted that last Friday we published new official statistics which show the recipients of our Small Business Bonus Scheme at a record high level with more than 96,000 properties benefiting. This is an increase of 50 per cent since we introduced the scheme back in 2008. Many thousands of business premises across Scotland's towns are seeing a real enduring benefit provided by the Small Business Bonus Scheme. We are also using the levers available to encourage long-term vacant premises, eh, back, premises back into use. One such example would be the expansion of Fresh Start relief to apply to pubs, hotels and restaurants from April this year. Of course. I, I, I think the, there are many good uh, points in, in the... In the in the first principle and, and talk about how we develop the town centres. However, the infrastructure itself it depends on transport infrastructure and the many diverse issues, particularly around car parking. I know we've had the Bus Investment Fund, but I just wonder what guidance and work is being done with, with uh, the local authorities on that. I certainly will return to the subject of transport and investment, but in revised Scottish planning policy, it makes it perfectly clear that that place-based strategy and accessibility is incredibly important. We won't have a national policy on parking, but parking is a constant issue that comes up that local authorities should most certainly reflect upon when making their decisions about their town centres. In addition to new powers uh, that we have all agreed on to local authorities to carry out enforcement action within town centres in relation to dangerous and defective uh, buildings, something I work very closely with the Labour Party on, has also empowered local authorities to ta tackle uh, such uh, buildings. We want to unlock potential that exists uh, locally, knowing that great things can happen. We empower people to achieve their own goals. Of course. Everybody? Minister also like to tell us what analysis has been carried out uh, on the impact of the empty property legislation and what um, pre and post analysis has he got in place to show what difference it's actually going to be making. Minister. Well, as it happens, the wholesale review into the changes to empty property rates relief will be undertaken uh, next year. Uh, but just today, I asked our, our advisor, Professor Lee Sparks, how he felt vacancy rates were within properties. And there's a report uh, coming out uh, early December which should inform us on the current and, and live position. But that wider analysis of the impact of those rates relief changes will be fully known in 2015 and will uh, respond uh, accordingly at that time. Uh, community Empowerment Bill, uh, I'm looking forward to progressing through Parliament, I think will break down further barriers and help create the conditions for community-led uh, regeneration in which we support, not least because it will extend the community right to buy to urban as well as the, the rural areas uh, as well, and I think that could be transformational. Uh, as well as this, earlier this year I launched a Stalled Spaces programme uh, which unlocks local potential. Uh, to, uh, in a both te temporary and permanent fashion, fill empty installed spaces with community-led uh, initiatives. And I also would support the uh, ability and encourage all members to support the ability as proposed in the Community Empowerment Bill to extend new powers to local authorities to create local relief schemes that are right for them in terms of the rates pressure that local businesses uh, face. Whilst mindful that a majority of the, uh, business premises in our town centres benefit from small business bonus, uh, as I've mentioned. So with the kind of action plan and 
uh, place-based reviews and principle in practice, I am convinced that longer-term outlook for our town centres uh, is good and is strong. In reviewing MPF3, I've made connections such as transport uh, and um, accessibility connections through policy as well to be considered when planning decisions uh, are made. And in that uh, respect, we've also given support to Sustrans and new funding also to ensure that travel networks are supported, including cycling uh, and walking. I heard particular complaints around digital towns and infrastructure, and that's why I've extended permitted development to renew the telecoms infrastructure in our town so that they can be part of the digital revolution as well and we'll carry out a specific demonstration project to support uh, digital uh, proactivity uh, within our towns and I've given support just today announced extra financial support of £119,000 towards a programme of town centre planning pilots in collaboration with nine planning authorities, as well as expanding on town centre charrette so that local people are engaged with uh, solutions going forward. I have charged with Scotland's town partnership with uh, new resources to be the go-to organisation to bring together external partners, work with others and provide much uh, support to communities across the country. Scotland's Town Partnership are also responsible for the Scotland's Towns Week, which runs from the 17th of November until the 23rd of November. I have also today announced new funding for business hubs in the community to try and have a cluster approach to support uh, innovation. I will continue my work with the external advisory group because their perspective is invaluable to the government's decisions going forward and again repeat my message about partnership with all when it comes to town centres because only by working in partnership will we be able to deliver for towns across Scotland and I look forward to the views of members from across the chamber this afternoon. Yeah, thanks. I now call on Gavin Brown to speak to uh, and move amendment 11386.1. Mr Brown, you have seven minutes, please. Presenting officer, thank you. Let me start by moving the amendment in my name and saying that there is nothing in the motion with which we on this side of the chamber disagree. The motion is fine as far as it goes. It notes publication of the report, welcomes the engagement, notes the demonstration phase, and so on and so forth. And we will support uh, the motion this evening at decision time tonight, uh, regardless of the result of the vote on our amendment. Um, and we welcome in particular, I think, the announcements about the small business bonus, a policy that the Conservatives have pushed for many years. And I think there is welcome news on the uh, sheer number of businesses benefiting and the value of that um, measure to businesses across Scotland. And I welcome also the Town Centre First principle. Um, but in welcoming that principle, it has to be effective on the ground. That was the purpose of my intervention on the Minister. Um, it has to be applied on the ground to actually make any impact. Because when we debated at town centres a year ago, the government was talking a good game about the town centre first principle, but at the same time, busy closing down courts in high streets across Scotland and busy uh, closing down uh, counters in police stations across Scotland. And we felt there was a contradiction between what the government was saying at the top level but what was actually happening on the ground. So we welcome the commitment and we hope that it does uh, signal a new approach uh, across Scotland uh, to a genuine town centre first principle. So we don't disagree with anything in the motion, but I think there are a number of things not in the motion uh, which we captured in our amendment, which I want to focus on and now explore over the course of the rest of my contribution. Because the yardstick by which the Scottish Government should be judged is the statement made by Nicola Sturgeon in July of 2012 when the external advisory group was set up to look at town centres. And she said this, we want to take every measure possible to ensure that our town centres are vibrant places. So the Scottish Government says it wants to take every measure possible, and that's where I think we need to look a little bit deeper to see if they're actually doing that, or is there more that could be done? Now, one of the biggest criticisms I've had of the Scottish Government is the business rates incentivisation scheme. A policy with which we agree 100%, in fact, Scottish Conservatives would go further than the Scottish Government did uh, in their manifesto for 2012. In theory, it's a great uh, policy which incentivises businesses, incentivises council, and leads to greater funds being spent on economic <coughs> development and obviously town centres. 
This was a flagship policy in the local government elections in 2012. However, in year one of operation, the goalposts were moved very late in the day. The thresholds that councils had been given were increased quite dramatically so that councils didn't benefit to the tune of the numbers that they were expecting and indeed merited. For 2013-14, the goalposts, goalposts were not even put up by the Scottish Government. They didn't even give uh, the Council's targets or incentives under the scheme. It was simply ignored. We're currently seven months into the financial year of 1415, and as far as I'm aware, and I could stand to be corrected, we don't have thresholds yet for Councils for what they're expected to achieve under that scheme. And we're about to uh, move into the formal part of the budget process uh, in the early part of next year for 1516, and who knows what kind of thresholds will be set there. Now, this is a government that said they could set up the entire apparatus of a new state in 18 months. But as we approach the fourth financial year of the business rates incentivisation scheme, it remains in cold storage. It hasn't had any impact on the ground. And a year ago, we were highly critical of the Scottish Government for a lack of progress. 12 months on, it's <coughs> difficult to see what progress has been made. Presenting officer, this could make a genuine difference to councils. The sums involved could be far larger than many of the sums announced by the minister in his contribution and indeed in the, indeed in the report. It's something that is good for councils and it's good for business and the funds could flow towards innovation, to regeneration, to town centres more widely and to, uh, to entrepreneurship. So I ask the government in closing today to give us a full update on that position and to make sure that this scheme actually gets going. Because the external advisory group, as we know, didn't just recommend that the scheme continues, they recommended BRIS Plus. They recommended that the scheme be enhanced. Sure, happy to give it. Mike McKenzie. I wonder, um, uh, since you feel it's so important to have some kind of financial incentive for councils to do the right thing, and I actually agree with you that it is, why is it therefore not important that the Scottish Government have powers and financial incentives sufficient for the Scottish Government to do the right thing? Mr Brown. Pre President, I'm, President Officer, I'm glad he agrees with me because it's his party's policy and has been uh, ever since the day uh, I think pretty much he was elected. Um, but I say to him, the Scotland Act 2012, he may have missed the draft budget that came forward just uh, uh, four or five weeks ago, which had uh, transferred powers being transferred and some of those very incentives to which he's so keen. But I say in return to the member, if he is so keen on the policy, why has he not put any pressure on his own front bench in relation to that particular policy? Why has he said nothing on that particular policy over the last couple of years, despite apparently being in favour of it? Deputy Presiding Officer, in other areas, I think some of the general progress has been slow. The document that was produced yesterday had two columns, what action was meant to happen and what has been achieved, but they deleted the column from the initial document that had the timescales for some of the actions to take place. So without actually comparing the two, some would think that more has been achieved uh, than actually uh, the government are letting on. I'll just give one example here. They talk about energy performance certificates. And they said they're going to strengthen the guidance to make sure that there is support for commercial premises to comply with the ratings at the point of sale and new lease in January of 2014. This was a short-term, six-month uh, target for something to be done about it when it was set a year ago. But in yesterday's document, a public consultation will be published on energy efficiency before the end of 2014. Now, I pick that out as one example, one of quite a number within the document where actually progress hasn't been made. So, um, while the government uh, have, has made some progress, while we will support uh, their motion today, there are a number of areas where they need to do far more, and in particular, on the business rates incentivisation scheme. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Sarah Boyack. Five minutes, please, Ms Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, we also welcome the chance to hear the update from the Minister on progress made. And we also are absolutely clear that we support the principles underpinning the Town Centre First policy. But the key for us is implementation. And there's a role for a critique on the fiscal mechanisms that the Scottish Government has been using thus far. 
But I would also argue that we need local authorities with more financial tools and more financial capability to make the cultural and infrastructure changes needed. Because our local authorities have a key role in civic leadership. Bids have been incredibly important in enabling town centre businesses and retailers to come together, especially in relation to management and marketing. But the civic role of local councils pulling together businesses and local communities to regenerate, revitalise and support town centres to make them places people want to visit is crucial. And over the last two summers, I have visited a range of town centres to see at first hand both best practice and hear about the challenges. And I have held a, a series of meetings with key stakeholders and community activists and town centre management specialists to draw on their expertise. And there is a lot of best practice and some really good work happening. Glasgow City support for cultural enterprises, uh, the work the Minister referred to on payday loan shops and controls on gambling shops. There's the work that Renfrew have done in terms of town centre management and public realm investment, Falkirk's business hub and support for training opportunities. But concerns in Lanark, for example, about how we get housing above shops to repopulate our high streets, that was a key message made in several local authority areas. I was particularly impressed this summer when I visited Dunfermline and looked at their town centre improvements on the high street, their work on signage and linking into tourism opportunities. And what was clear there was that they had made a clear political choice, a, a leadership decision to bring about that investment. Because with 32 towns in Fife, focusing on Dunfermline means that other towns have to wait. And that is a challenge that you can see across Scotland. Our big local authorities with many town centres, even though they have some resource in terms of staffing, they don't have the resource in terms of cash. And the smaller authorities have neither the staff nor the cash. So there's a real challenge there. And Alec Rowley will be closing for this debate, but it was really interesting to see the impact of that strategic decision to invest money, to prioritise investment, had made a real difference. Now, I think there's a lot more that the Scottish Government can do. The policy has been in place. It's already been uh, exposed that it's not always being implemented by the Scottish Government. In East Kilbride, their major issue was that new NHS investment had missed the opportunity to come to the town centre and had missed the opportunity to bring thousands of trips to the town centre from NHS staff. The issue of CPO orders still is mentioned by authority after authority. It prevents them getting to grips with the properties which are owned by private landowners who are sitting on properties for years without investment, sometimes because they don't have the investment capital available either. So I think we need a rethink on planning capacity. There's not the scope in most planning authorities and certainly not the financial capacity in authorities to actually get out and do the big planning projects that we might have seen 10, 20 years ago. And there is a real challenge because at the moment planning is more regulating, it's more looking at proposals that have come in, but there are many, many town centres where with more scope, uh, more staff resource, it would be easier to bring forward the kind of major projects that you can see in Edinburgh and Glasgow, where you have transformative investment taking place. That isn't available for our out-of-town authorities, and it's certainly not available for our smaller authorities. The work of pulling together with housing associations, taking on land assembly, buying up properties, and then invest investing and in refurbishing ground floor properties for retail, or then looking at compatible uses, and particularly housing use in the upper floors. That simply isn't possible in the current framework. And that, I think, is something that the Scottish Government needs to look at. We need to make sure that local authorities can use that civic leadership democratic role that they have. They need to work to support businesses, but there are also times when market failure means they need to actually take a lead, set out a vision, set out a plan, resource that plan, and bring the business community and local communities with them. More capacity to borrow on the strength of new housing in our town centres, more scope to use CPO powers to enable much needed investment to take place. And the powers we identified in our Devolution Commission document, Powers for a Purpose, would give the authorities the chance to take the lead that is so clearly needed. Local authorities need the capacity to develop vision, they need the finance and they need the staff resources. So while we welcome this year's annual report, there is much, much more that needs to be done. Thanks very much. And we now move to open debate. 
I call on Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Margaret MacDougall. Four minute speeches, up to four minutes, please, Mr. Hepburn. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Officer, and, uh, can I uh, welcome the debate and also welcome the Government's Town Centre uh, Action Plan? Members uh, may be aware of something uh, called the Carbuncle Awards, in particular, uh, one of those awards, the Pluck on the Plinth, which is an award for uh, the most dismal uh, town uh, in Scotland, uh, organised by Urban Realm magazine. I consider these awards to be very unhelpful, not least because uh, the town in which I live and which I represent, Cumberland, has won that uh, award uh, and has regularly uh, nominated it, has uh, predictably been nominated uh, this year uh, again. And I consider that to be very unhelpful because I think Cumberland is actually one of the best towns in the uh, country to live in. It's got good schools, good transport links, an abundance of uh, green space uh, in and around the town. And the award certainly wouldn't recognise the strong uh, sense of civic uh, pride uh, that many individuals, many organisations have in uh, the town. Uh, and I think, I believe the primary reason that Cumberland keeps getting uh, and this uh, award of being continually nominated for this award, uh, President Officer, is, and you'll be glad to see this is where I'm bringing it to the point of the debate, is its town uh, centre. Uh, Cumberland uh, Town Centre is uh, largely composed of what was built as the UK's first indoor uh, shopping centre. I suppose that befits the innovation of uh, the time. And it does have its defenders, many architects uh, praise its vision and uh, the design, but even those who uh, resolutely defend it uh, in terms of its architectural merit must uh, recognise its modern uh, failings. Much of the town centre is now very uh, dilapidated. Many of the units there are vacant and certainly uh, aesthetically, I don't think it could be uh, described as an overwhelmingly uh, welcoming place, presiding officer. So any uh, action plan that can assist the revitalisation of coming out town centre would be very welcome. And one area that might be unexpected about coming out town centre, which is primarily thought of as a retail uh, space, is uh, uh, the possibility of trying to encourage uh, people to see it also as a, a place to live in as well as to shop in, because there are actually uh, some apartments there that have been vacant for uh, some time. And I know as part of the action plan there was uh, funding for a, a town centre housing fund. I actually brought that to the attention of the managers of the town centre. I'm unaware as to whether they sought uh, to uh, uh, benefit by that uh, fund. I did see other places uh, benefit by it, and it would be interesting to know how successful uh, those uh, uh, experiences have been. And also, I see the government is considering the future of this fund, and I'll certainly be looking to see where that goes and if there's any possibilities uh, for uh, my town centre, uh, 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 officer. And I've mentioned the, the town centre owners. Uh, unlike most uh, town centres across uh, Scotland. Cumberland Town Centre is actually privately owned, and that's part of uh, the problem in uh, trying to take forward a strategy for its regeneration, because it's not only is it privately owned, it's uh, privately owned by multiple owners with competing uh, commercial interests. The local authority clearly has a role to play in revitalising Cumberland Town Centre, but it, it can only do so much given its private ownership. So it would be good to hear from the Minister uh, how uh, any town centre action plan can involve uh, the private uh, sector and private owners uh, to encourage uh, redevelopment. I want to just finish by talking about the town centre uh, first uh, principle. I do uh, welcome uh, this uh, concept, uh, particularly in the fashion, encourages the public sector to look at town centres first for locating uh, their uh, services. But I would caution against it being viewed as a bar to development uh, elsewhere in our towns, particularly uh, our larger towns. Cumberland is a population of 50,000 and is growing. And recently, we saw an application for new retail at a location in the town which needs that investment. The planners recommended against uh, approval, despite recognising that there is nowhere in the town centre for such development. I am thankful that elected councillors uh, uh, disagreed and granted approval. It does serve as a reminder that uh, uh, some planning officials might look to apply a town centre first principle as a town centre only uh, principle, and we need to ensure that is not the case. But overall, uh, I think uh, this action plan is very welcome. I welcome the progress uh, in that regard, and I certainly can hope it helps bear fruit in my constituency. Many thanks. I now call on Margaret McDougall to be followed by Willie Coffey. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the cross-party group on towns and town centres, I appreciate this opportunity to reflect on the Town Centre Action Plan. And I know the Minister has engaged with the stakeholders represented on the group on several occasions, and I thank him for that. With a change in leadership later this month, it is likely that there will be a reshuffle in the Scottish Government, and many members of the cross-party group believe it is important that there continues to be a minister with specific responsibilities for town centres. We need to know there is someone in government 
who is responsible for driving forward the action plan and who remains accountable to the Parliament for its implementation. I am sure the cross-party group will work constructively with whoever that person is <laughs> and to keep town centres and regeneration firmly on the political agenda. <laughs> there is no one size fits all solution to town centre regeneration. In many of our communities we face common challenges, but that does not mean there are always uniform solutions. In North Ayrshire, in my own region, I can see how the Irvine Bay Regeneration Company and its partners are transforming Irvine by breathing new life into the town centre and in co-winning before that, although car parking, car parking remains an issue in both towns. I can also see how in Largs, only a few miles away, they came up with a different solution, adopting the bid model after a rigorous and sometimes animated debate in the business community. We cannot regenerate our towns from the political centre, but we can do it by implementing the town centre first principle and providing funding, guidance and support. The Scottish Government has to give our councils and our communities the tools they need to make our town centres more vibrant, more accessible, more inviting and more economically resilient. Presiding officer, retail is changing, how we access services and purchase goods is changing and the constant growth of new technology means that our lifestyles are changing too. But let's be clear, there is still a place and there must always be a place for community, for a safe and modern public realm and for our town centres. We know that we need to understand those town centres better. We need to collate and disseminate more local data and information about town centres. We need to map changes in our local economies and help local leaders identify opportunities for growth, investment and job creation. So I welcome the work of the Understanding Scottish Places Consortium to develop typologies, benchmarks and a toolkit to help practitioners understand their towns. And I ask the Minister how the Government intend to roll out that toolkit across the country and when they expect to do so. On housing, there is a recognition that we have to repopulate and revive town centres as living communities, as well as places where we go to shop, to socialise and to use services. To that end, I welcome the Town Centre Housing Fund, and according to the government's website, awards from the fund totaled £2.7 million, yet it delivered less than 100 new affordable homes across the country. We can't argue that the fund is transformational, but it has shown councils and housing associations what is possible with investment and imagination. In their action plan, the government also commit to identify best practice and models of engagement to encourage owners to turn empty units into affordable homes. It would be helpful if the government could elaborate on some of these practices and engagement models, as I expect we all know of vacant properties in our constituencies and regions which could be put to better use. I'm just, fin I'm just finishing, presiding officer. You are indeed. It, it is impossible to say everything that needs to be said about town centres in one short debate. But the Parliament can be assured that because of the importance of this really issue, there will be plenty of opportunities to continue the discussion between the Chamber and the communities where the success of this action plan will ultimately be judged. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, Colin Willie Coffey to be followed by George Adam. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Coffey. Thanks very much, President Officer. Our, our town centres are like our people. They've got a past, a present and a future, and they'll never stop changing. All of them are different, and all of them have their own character. Our task in government is to recognise the issues they face through the years, help where we can, and set up the conditions that allow them to adapt and to flourish. Everybody has a stake in this, Government, the public and the companies and property owners who own many of our town centre buildings. Many people, mainly older people, look back and wish that their towns were the way they were in the past. Fine old buildings, streets filled with local traders and department stores, no pound shops perhaps or payday loan shops. And many younger people look forward 
I wish for the modern shops we see in our bigger cities and out-of-town modern malls with cafes to enjoy and meeting places to spend some time with friends. So who, who's right? Both are, of course, and that's why this is a difficult task, I think, for any, mon any minister and government, to preserve the best of our town centre history and heritage, to plan ahead with sensitivity, but to open the doors to new possibilities and new aspirations. A tall order, but not one that should be the ministers alone. We must work in partnership with all of those who have a clear stake in our towns. The review of our town centres and the resulting action plan are making an impact. The Small Business Bonus Scheme is helping nearly 100,000 small businesses that the Minister mentioned earlier. Fresh Start is offering further help to bring back into use those empty shops that have been vacant for a year or more. And the Town Centre Housing Fund is helping to bring some life back into our towns, and particularly at night. I am hopeful too that Maeve's moves to make more of our towns digital towns with free Wi-Fi will be an attraction, particularly for many of our younger citizens. In my own town of Kilmarnock, there have been some spectacular and transformational changes taking place in recent years, which the Minister has seen for himself. Historic old buildings like the Palace, Grand Hall, the Opera House and Johnny Walker Whiskey Bond have all been modernised and beautifully lit. The magnificent John Finney Street, almost totally in red sandstone and nothing like it anywhere else in Scotland, fully restored. Our historic viaduct taking centre stage and becoming an iconic symbol of the town, also beautifully lit at night. And currently, new housing is embedded in the heart of the town that will bring a vibrancy that we hope will benefit everyone, including the many local quality traders that we have there. Yet, some problems do remain, of course, and people are entitled to expect everyone, not just government, local and national, to try to address these. Many of my constituents still talk about shops that do lie empty and derelict, with no sign of improvement, sometimes over, over many years. And other people may highlight the fears that they sometimes have about shopping in the town centres that are sadly often a focal point for gatherings of people with addiction issues and the consequent disruption that this can cause to, to many shoppers. Now, we can't do everything overnight and we don't have unlimited resources, but we can try and we need to think differently about how best to try and tackle some of those issues. I think the public can and should have a direct role in generating new ideas for their town centres at the early stages of planning, not as consultees when the architectural drawings are finalised. They should be involved from the start in shaping and taking ownership of their own towns. The corporates and property owners must make a contribution too, and I think ask whether current rent levels are appropriate for the current market conditions that we face. In government, President officer, we can only do so much but we have achieved a lot in a relatively short time and we all have a stake in improving our town centres. I'm confident that if we can continue that good progress and examine some of the issues that I've highlighted, we'll see further positive transformations taking place in our town centres in the years to come. Thank you. Many thanks. We're now very tight for time. I call on George Adam to be followed by Cara Hilton. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to speak in this debate, being the MSP for the largest town in Scotland. The town centre of Paisley is a fantastic place. Now, I may be slightly biased when I say that, uh, presiding officer, but it's got fabulous buildings, many exciting events that ha are happening in the town. And more importantly, the people of Paisley are extremely friendly and always welcoming. The decline in our high street has been documented uh, throughout the past couple of decades, and it's mirrored by other towns in other areas who have similar challenges and problems that we've had to deal with. But I believe that the Scottish Government's Town Centre Action Plan can make a significant impact and change the fortunes of not just Paisley, but other towns uh, across uh, town centres across our country. The Minister is quite right when he talks about the historic environment bill, uh, this coming debate coming after that, because obviously in towns like Paisley, you're walking through the historic environment when you go by with the Paisley Abbey, Coates Memorial Church, there's various other buildings that are constantly being an important part of our past, which are now used in the present. But that comes to the challenges that many towns like Paisley are having as well, is the fact that maybe some of these buildings are used by Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, or possibly by the local authority. And as 
services change, then, of course, they end up no longer using these buildings. We had such a case where we had uh, the Russell Institute, which was used by Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. But luckily, I managed to get all the individuals together, and the Paisley Development Trust, with investment from the Scottish Government, is now going to be taking over that building and ensuring that it's still a major part of Paisley's future. And I think that's what we've got to look at, because our town has seen the Scottish Government investment building new homes in the town centre. Uh, right next to Paisley, town, uh, Paisley Abbey with a sensational backdrop there. And this has increased footfall in many of the businesses in Paisley. In particular, I can talk about one small coffee shop with two young businessmen opened up, which is now extremely busy because they are getting directly their seconds away from these two areas where the Scottish Government's invested, and they're getting increased footfall. So that shows you how we can get people back into our town centres and ensure that we can create the type of uh, future for them that we all want. But uh, one of the things that I'll say is the small business bonus has made a massive difference to many retailers within Paisley as well. I know of many small businesses who wouldn't be retailing in Paisley at the presently if it hadn't been for this uh, bonus. And it's a great assistance to them. In Renfrewshire, 2,475 small businesses are benefiting to the tune of £5.1 million in 2014-15. That's the kind of investment and that's what's making a difference in town centres across Scotland. Scotland. You know, the Scottish Government's protected local government funding in drastic contrast to what we've seen down south and the uh, outcome of the spending review of 2011's setting out a real terms decrease of 18.6% for 2012-15. And one of the other ideas that the Scottish Government has come up with was the fact of the Business Improvement District. Now, we have this happening in Paisley as we speak. In fact, it will come as no surprise to you since my own premise is within that area that once again, President Officer, I will be voting yes in Paisley because I will be supporting the bid ideal in Paisley because all these business people who have got together and have worked towards trying to take ownership because the people who work and live in Paisley are the best people to actually deliver for that town and ensure that we can make that difference. So I have supported them and I commend every single one of the people involved in that group. Ironically, that group is called Paisley First, and that brings us full circle round to the main debate we are having here, which is town centres first. And I would say, you know, there's been so much work done, there's been so much events brought to Paisley, which the Minister and myself were part of when we were in local government. We've done so much at the moment. All we have to do now, presiding officer, is build on that work and take that to the next level and ensure that we deliver for our town centres. Excellent. Thank you for that unbiased view about Paisley. Thank you very much. Now call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Graham Day. Thank you, President Officer. Regenerating, reviving and renewing our town centres is a challenge that we're all united in, and it's certainly one of the biggest issues for my constituents in Dunfermline. I strongly welcome the town centre first principle, an approach which is already delivering real results despite the very difficult financial challenges that local authorities face. It's a principle that's moving us closer to to our town centres not just being a place to shop, but being right at the heart of public, community and social life. The reality is our town centres will never again be a place where we just go to shop. Our town centres have got to embrace leisure, not just retail, be a place where people live, not just visit, and be vibrant day and night all year round. Recently, I was pleased to welcome my colleague Sarah Boyack to Dunfermline to meet with local stakeholders, businesses, volunteer groups, entrepreneurs and elected members to showcase the fantastic work that Fife Council is doing to uh, regenerate town, Dunfermline Town Centre. Already £1 million invested in the town centre in projects including free Wi-Fi, flood lighting of iconic buildings, restoration of Dunfermline City Chambers, winter festival lighting, digital signage, floral displays, promotional campaigns, all aimed at making Dunfermline a more attractive place to visit day and night and backed up by a longer term town centre action plan and other initiatives such as a £2.2 million investment in Dunfermline Cycle Network, the Fire Station Creative Project and a £12 million partnership to create a new Dunfermline Museum and Art Gallery right in the centre of the town. But clearly there's a lot more to do and particularly in, in respect of empty units and derelict buildings on our high streets and I believe that we could do a lot more here with more devolution of power and resources to our local authorities so that they've got the power in their own hands to facilitate local economic regeneration even further. This motion today talks about the importance of a renewed spirit of entrepreneurialism in our town centres as a key to their social and economic success and really this is key and pleased too it's an area where we're making good progress in Dunfermline. 
In 2013, Dunfermline hosted the first ever Carnegie Test Town final, an initiative based on matching the oversupply of space in our town centres with the huge supply of talent and ideas in our young people, asking young people to come up with new and enterprising uses for shops, offices, stalls, other vacant spaces in our towns and our cities. Test Town is now the UK's biggest town centre business challenge, and I would commend the Carnegie Trust for this brilliant idea, which really has captured the imagination of young people in Scotland and across the UK. Locally in Dunfermline, Test Town's success has led to Fife Council and local traders ruling out their own Venture Street programme to build a lasting enterprise legacy for our town centre. Venture Street is going to be right at the heart of Dunfermline's Winter Festival and will run right up to Christmas Eve. And I'd like to wish all those participating in Venture Street every success in what some have called Dunfermline's version of The Apprentice. So that's obviously something that we're all going to be looking forward to. So will some paint a picture of doom and gloom when talking about our high streets? There is a lot to be excited and enthusiastic about too. But that doesn't mean that there's no challenges. A Carnegie Trust report... Um, Looking at the Test Town graduates found that there are significant cost barriers in town centre trading, challenges that they could probably easily avoid if they traded online. Business rates are often excessive, even for start-ups, and rents are simply too high. Too many landlords continue to seek long-term, highly inflexible agreements with new tenants, and this can be a real stumbling block to even the most committed in getting a business off the ground. The town centre-first philosophy certainly doesn't seem to extend to many banks who tend to favour online ventures over town centre ventures when making investment decisions. So while we're seeing real progress, there's still much more to do, and we do need more action to break down those barriers to participation in the town centre economy. If we're going to ensure that our town centres are not just somewhere we go and spend a couple of hours on a Saturday, but places with a purpose, places close, where people please. want to visit and spend time in, where they want to live and bring up their families, and places right at the hub of the social um, and community life. Thank you. Excellent. Many thanks. I now call on Graham Day, after which we move to closing speeches. Thank you. I think it's worth reminding ourselves of just what the Scottish Government is doing to assist our town centres. And I want to do that by focusing specifically on the area of the country that I represent. Across the whole of Angus, in excess of £20 million has gone into the Small Business Bonus Scheme since its introduction. £3.7 million of support has been provided in the present financial year alone. That's real help for more and more businesses, with the number of small-scale operations either having had their rates, bills abolished or substantially reduced, having risen from 1,854 in 2008 to 2,000. 361 this year. Additionally, in my own constituency, uh, Kerry Muir, thanks partly to a £645,000 uh, grant from Historic Scotland, there's been established a conservation area regeneration scheme in partnership with Angus Council. The scheme, all told, will offer grants amounting to £1.1 million over five years, aimed at enhancing the, the, the look of the town centre. Additionally, Angus is to be the location of one of the four business hubs mentioned by the Minister, and Carnoustie is one of the seven towns across Scotland to benefit from the £2.7 million pound town centre housing fund. A sum of £200,000 being secured for the fund, from the fund to provide up to four houses in Carnoustie High Street. Angus Council plans to build these properties on the site of one of two former retail units which were destroyed in a fire. Locally there was a view and one I would ideally share that the retail unit in question should have been rebuilt but there was, it seems, no takers for such an opportunity. And therein lies one of the problems at the heart of the challenge we face in revitalising our high streets. You, you cannot magic up businesses to fill properties, especially not properties which are constrained by being located in long-established buildings. Even on an attractive high street like Carnoustie's, containing some niche shops and capable of attracting, within the past year, a leading retailer like Boots, there's a surplus of available units. And in part, that's down to existing units being unsuitable size-wise to meet the requirements of potential incomers. However, high streets aren't just a, uh, uh, about buildings, they're about people as well. And as we strive for better, there must surely be a role to be played by the public. Like many members across this chamber who represent constituencies containing towns of whatever size, I hear many complaints about the state of the high streets, lack of shops of the kind people want. Yet at the same time, I know of shops in Carnoustie and indeed our Broth, for example, which are attracting custom from well out with Angus, such as the product and the company and quality of service they're offering. But if we as local consumers do not support local shops, then it is any wonder for sale signs or rent signs adorn our high streets. This cannot only be about government support or locally driven initiatives. There's a need and perhaps even a responsibility too for the public to wherever possible seek to spend a proportion of their disposable income in the shops located in the heart of our towns rather than taking up the convenient option of buying everything under one roof in large scale supermarkets. 
President Officer, in concluding, can I pick up on a point that Gavin Bowne made earlier about the impact on high streets of court and police counter closures? His observations, while I accept, be valid in many places, but not everywhere. The closure of Arbroath Sheriff Court met with a mixed response because Owing to the constraints on the building, we had an issue there with undesirables loitering on the pavement outside, impacting on footfall, much to the annoyance of neighbouring businesses. Efforts are currently being made to bring the building back into use, serving a purpose which potentially at least will increase footfall in the area, providing a boost for those businesses. And in nearby Carnoustie, the police counter which closed was located a good half mile from the town centre. Police Scotland and Angus Council are presently in discussions over relocating the entire police presence to a location at the very heart of the High Street. And I draw the Chamber's attention to this by way simply of supporting a point that was made earlier, that no two town centres are the same and the solutions to improving them are not the same either. Thank you. Thank you for your brevity. Now move to closing speeches. Call on Cameron McCannon. Four minutes, please. And you'll be relieved to hear I'm not going to speak about my own town. Scotland's town centres, is, that's what its discussion is about today, and their future, and it has highlighted the crucial role that small businesses play in town centres, which, unsurprisingly, I wish to focus on. We all wish to see flourishing and diverse high streets return to our town centres, and a combination of entrepreneurial spirit and government support can go a long way towards achieving this. Government of all levels can play a crucial role in revitalising our town centres, chiefly in two ways by levelling the playing field with larger businesses and by cutting the fixed costs of high street businesses. It is widely agreed that local businesses are struggling to compete with both larger retail outlets in suburban developments and the rising popularity and indeed novelty of online shopping. Customers shop online and in many shops in out-of-town developments because of simplicity. In other words, the issue is convenience. And it is that, essence, that is the essence of the matter. We must make it as easy to shop in your local high street as it is to shop elsewhere. I would first like to say that we should, in no, under no circumstances, can see this as a reason to discriminate against out-of-town and online businesses. That would simply not be fair, nor in the customer's best interests. Rather, we must level the playing field by making it easier for high street retailers to compete for customers. Based on what we keep hearing from shoppers, probably the biggest problem is the lack of adequate parking facilities in town centres, particularly when compared to large shopping centres. It is simply too much hassle, too expensive to drive into a town centre to shop, not to mention that you'll be frequently struggle to find a spot to park your car for long enough without facing potential death threats from traffic wardens. All of this does high street retailers no favours, and I believe that we could and should turn this around, but in partnership with councils. To deliver this change, I continue to believe that we and the local authorities need to provide resources and the means for extra parking spaces and cheaper parking rates. Furthermore, there is much to be said for making park and ride schemes more attractive to use. The balance between these solutions is a matter for debate, but I hope we can all agree on the need to facilitate easier transport to and from town centres so that it is just as e attractive and as easy to go to your local high street as an out-of-town retail park. The second approach we could help our high streets would have involve government stepping back rather than stepping in. I'm talking here about rates relief. A model that we could learn from is that in certain areas of the United States where standalone businesses with single outlets are offered a discount on their business rates in order to encourage originality and diversification on the high streets. Too often in Scotland we hear that all town centres consist of the same brands of multiple outlets. This would chime with a long-awaited and long-delayed business rates incentivisation scheme, as it would give local authorities the chance, the chance to, redevelopment, to, 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 to drive the redevelopment themselves. You see in the United States many different town centres with distinctive shops in them, which we don't tend to have here. It would be hoped that the impact of such policies would bring high streets filled with varied, competitive, appealing and sustainable businesses, including post offices, libraries and other things. This would increase the chance, the choice presented to customers, make their shopping experiences easier, and in some cases, make it cheaper. Furthermore, the benefit of local jobs and local economies would be far-reaching. That's what we should be aiming for, and I trust that we can all agree to strive for this. Accordingly, presiding officer, there's a great deal that can be done to support our town centres, and there's a clear direction of what could and should be done. We can all agree on the desirability of a vibrant and diverse high street, yet to achieve this, the government must take action on the business rates and give the local authorities the means to make driving into town centres much, much more appealing. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I now call on Alec Rowley. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I did um, try and follow the Minister's speech, but he, he went fairly quick and I didn't pick up on a lot of it. But he did say the longer term outlook is good and strong. And whilst I think that you know, progress has been made, I would have to say we have a long way to go. Um, Boots um, Alliance Boots sent out a briefing where they point out that one in nine retail outlets are lying empty. And so they're saying that the challenge is to ensure that, that, that um, they're better equipped to support the economic and social aspirations of our communities. And um, Willie Coffey picked up on that point where he talked about involving communities and communities taking ownership. I accept the point that, that Graham Day makes that no two town centres are alike. And whilst there may well be different solutions for different town centres, we, we would, I believe, think, find that most of the types of problems that town centres are facing um, are similar. And the Minister said that he was keen to come here today and listen in terms of how we move forward. Um, Cara Hilton mentioned the test town, the Carnegie UK Trust test town. And one of the issues when the Carnegie UK Trust ran that test town in Dunfermline was that actually the, the, the biggest barrier to many of the young people, the entrepreneurs of tomorrow, being able to access these, these um, premises was the inflated costs of rents. And that's an issue, I think, and certainly most of the town centres that I'm aware of in Fife, um, that's, that's got to be addressed. The landlords are asking unrealistic rents and way above where the market should be at. And we need to address that. But I would say to the Minister that I actually believe that local authorities need to have more power. Local authorities, if you look at, can use the planning system, um, I believe, more innovatively in terms of looking at town centres and looking at town centre renewal. The licensing committees, for example, can play a big part. Tourism can be a major factor and a, and a key um, industry in, in many of our town centres when looking at, at, at um, how, how we regenerate those town centres. Um, but it does, mean, it does mean that we need more of a focus. If we accept, for example, that in many of our town centres, part of the solution is to repopulate those town centres. And I think if you look at Kirkcaldy, for example, in Fife, that certainly is the view of Fife Council, that, that actually getting people back into living in the town centre would be a key way forward. Then we need to look at targeting specific, specific financial support to actually um, support local authorities in doing that. But if you look at the case of Dunfermline that was mentioned earlier, um, putting the local authority in the driving seat, because what I've learned from looking at, at these town centres is that there needs to be strong, strong leadership driving the town centre renewal. And in Dunfermline, you have the bids company, um, which is, 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 um, has new leadership in place now. But I would suggest that it was a decision by Fife Council to put a million pound into that town centre, working in partnership with um, the local groups and the bids company that started to drive that forward. It was then a decision of Fife Council to put an area manager in that was going to actually drive that forward, pull people together, work with the bids company. So you do need in town centres strong leadership, I would suggest, and the evidence is there. More recently, the Fife Council also took a decision to invest a million pound into Kirkcaldy town centre. And again, it is by putting strong leadership. It's not money alone, but it's working with all the key stakeholders. And it comes back to Willie Coffey's point. I recently um, asked the Director of Community Development Trust Scotland um, if he would be kind enough to come up to Cowan Meath in my constituency and have a look at perhaps what we would actually do to move forward there. It's a smaller town centre than Dunfermline and Kirkcaldy, um, and it is also, no doubt, suffering um, a decline. And he gave me examples for Haddington and many other parts of Scotland where local people have begun to take control of their town centres, working with retailers, actually being able to take over some of these small units that are there and encourage local businesses to come in to those, those areas. So I think actually empowering local communities, as, as Willie Coffey has suggested, is, is, is a way forward. Um, 
Margaret McDougall raised a number of important issues around car parking, job creation, the cost of car parking. And, you know, if, if the evidence is, and in some town centres the evidence is, if you took the charges off, you would actually create a bigger problem in terms of um, not having enough car parking. That's not the case in every town centre. But if you go back to what the Minister said about the dangerous and defective um, bills led legislation that went through, and now the Community Empowerment Bill, when I first saw the powers in there for local authorities to be able to um, look at local schemes that they can come up with, um, it's, it's quite an exciting prospect. The only difficulty is, and I come back to parking as well, is that local authorities are under major financial pressures at this time and therefore to be able to lift car park charges. I know some authorities have tried in some areas where coming up to Christmas they have free parking after three o'clock, that type of thing, but that all costs money. It actually costs millions of pounds. And we do have local authorities that have been using charges as a way of trying to get around some of the cuts that they're actually making. There was an interesting proposition put forward by Alliance Boots where they suggested that a business rate incentivisation scheme where local authorities are allowed to keep 100% of the rates above an agreed level can be an effective tool to drive forward town centre regeneration if it was ring fenced. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that that would be the initiative. Must we pick up on. But I do hope that the local government minister does intend to work with other authorities looking at council tax and looking at the future of local government finance and as part of that we really perhaps must close, look at please, how Lee. local authorities can be empowered to do more and lead in town centres. Thank you. I now call on the minister to wind up the debate on behalf of the government minister you have until 5.15. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I think this is a very positive, constructive uh, and useful debate uh, going forward. Can I turn to the last speaker first, Alec Rowley? He pointed out uh, very helpfully that I raced through the second half of my speech rather carelessly as a government minister. That was a good bit with the funding announcements. But having taken the three interventions, I somewhat panicked when I realised I was on page 9 of 19 with two minutes to go. So for a full explanation of the funding packages announced, then see the detail in the government's press release. I'm sure you'll all be rushing to it after decision time. But I do think there's good news and progress and partnership working. Uh, the omission of timescales, Mr Brown, was nothing other than as being helpful in providing the yearly update report that Parliament didn't ask me to do, but in my constructive style I wanted to offer to stakeholders and, of course, to Parliament. And I think that's helped to engender a, a lively and useful uh, discussion uh, to suggest the way forwards and what you think are the, uh, the weaknesses in our action plan. And I'll certainly uh, reflect upon all of those points. I won't make any party political points because that's not been the nature of the debate. But I would point out, just in terms of resource, it is very difficult to create new resources when our budget has been cut by Westminster. But that said, we have still nonetheless identified new funds for town centres, eh, but would expect all public authorities to consider the totality of their resources in making a town centre eh, a priority. Um, in terms of individual comments, I think Cameron Buchanan made helpful comments around the importance of accessibility, business rates, of course, and even the issue about driving into town centres. Driving into a town centre might not always be the wrong thing to do. That's accepted wisdom. But accessibility in every form, it will be different from town centre to town centre. Back to Alec Rowley's point, say, boots of given us very helpful suggestions. I've invited them on to the external uh, advisory a group touched upon uh, rental prices. I think that's right. I think far too many landlords are still trying to achieve the rental regimes that they got in better days. But we will have further powers around compulsory transfer and proactive planning and compulsory purchase orders, some of which we'll pilot through the course of the next uh, year or two, and expanded powers on local authorities around those local rates relief schemes as well should assist local authorities to have the power added to the leadership and resource to be able to take the town centre agenda forward. Uh, Alec Rowley pointed out we should put local authorities in the driving seat. I would argue they already are. Local economic development rests with them, but we recognise our responsibility as a government to help set the conditions to support town centre regeneration to make that difference and empower local communities. We'll be able to do 
even more of that through the Community Empowerment Bill. But in terms of uh, resources, there's regeneration funds, the Town Centre Housing Fund, the People and Communities Fund, and other uh, funds that I can identify to support individual communities taking forward partnership uh, projects. Uh, Sarah Boyack referred to business improvement districts, as did many others. Absolutely, the government supporting business improvement districts made resources available to expand them. Uh, we support absolutely repopulation of our town centres and housing uh, above shops. And I think there will be an expanded toolkit in terms of planning and the financial tools as well to support uh, our town uh, centres and greater use, if that's appropriate, of compulsory purchase orders and the acquisition of private sector um, assets as well if they're abandoned and neglected in town centres through the community uh, empowerment bill. So I think that planning authorities will be more proactive going forward. Gavin Brown again raised bris and asked for an update. In the coming weeks, the new regime as agreed with local authorities and Scottish Government, will be published, recognising where the system did not work effectively before, but there is now a replacement in place, agreed by leaders and government, to be published imminently. And I think that will create the kind of scheme going forward that Gavin, Browers, uh, Gavin Brown and others, I am sure, uh, would uh, welcome. I think that many local authorities have shown their ability to adapt to circumstances and support great schemes in local communities. I mentioned four of them earlier. Out of impartiality and fairness to Labour, to SNP, led authorities where they are locating and identifying public services within town centres, relocating staff in town centres and supporting private sector investment in town centres as well. Jamie Hepburn was right to criticise um, unhelpful comments such as the pluck and the plinth, but then it showcased how we can be positive and reinvigorate uh, civic pride in our communities. And for Jamie Hepburn, of course, that was Cumbernauld and spoke about private sector leadership as well as public sector leadership. And I would commend the work of RTPI Scotland for creating Scotland's Great Places, which celebrates the positive in Scotland. Uh, Margaret MacDougall, of course, is the chair of the cross party group. And town centre spoke about partnership working, her experiences in, in Ayrshire, uh, and uh, the tools that local communities need to do the job. Planning toolkit will be forthcoming, repopulation of town centres, and important engagement models. And I'm delighted that Nicola Sturgeon, the Deputy First Minister, has just joined me because she also mentioned reshuffle in her contribution to say that I know it's not etiquette to mention it in the chamber, presiding officer, and I'm informed by my uh, boss, no, it's not. However, the point that was made is that a dedicated minister for town centres has been appreciated and should uh, continue uh, going forward. Pitch. Willie Coffey, uh, no, it's not a pitch. Uh, <laughs> Willie Coffey. <laughs> Willie Coffey, as much as I enjoy my portfolio, I have to say, uh, Willie Coffey spoke about the changing nature of town centres, the partnership approach and the wonderful opportunities of digital that we support. And that's why we amended the permitted development rights to ensure that the infrastructure is in place, the investments in place to expand mobile coverage and community broadband as well. And also spoke of using the majestic buildings in Ayrshire uh, and uh, Kilmarnock. Graham Day spoke about his community in Angus and how it's benefited from a range of funds that are currently available, not least the housing fund, business hubs and other start-up projects to create that vibrancy and that dynamism within our town centres to create diversification, digital uh, and other opportunities including employment uh, and local business start-ups. Cara Hilton, I thought, gave a very passionate speech about the work in Fife, particularly uh, Dan Fermline, talking about town centres being more than just retail, the principle that's established in partnership about town centre first between Scottish Government and local government being so powerful and a catalyst for change, and also covered the devolution of power and the leadership role that local authorities can have to great fantastic uh, projects such as uh, Venture Street uh, and other local uh, innovations, the potential of online, and indeed the participation and the role that uh, local community groups can play in empowering local communities. And George Adam, rather out of character, mentioned Paisley, the historic <laughs> environment, and gave us an example of how a fantastic, iconic building that is the Russell Institute, supported by government funding, will create that regeneration. And of course, George Adam would be first to point out that Scotland's Town Partnership, the week of Scotland's Town, will be in Paisley this year, and I'm sure George will be seeking uh, to be there. 
Uh, funding, business rates, government support is all to set the right conditions to reinvigorate uh, our town centre and I'll look forward to continuing to work in partnership with the external advisory group and others to ensure that our town centres have a very strong and vibrant future and thank all members for their constructive approach to today's debate. Thank you, Minister. That's the first time I've heard a job application in the Chamber. I'm sure many of uh, your colleagues in the Chamber will help you polish your CV. That concludes the debate on the Town Centre Action Plan one year on. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 11380 in the name of Nicholas Sturgeon on the Deregulation Bill UK legislation. I call on Keith Brown to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. The question this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 10756 in the name of John Swinney on the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Bill UK legislation. I call on John Swinney to move the motion. Before we move, Thank you, Officer. Cabinet Secretary. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 11378, in the name of Fiona Hislop, on the Historic Environment Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is agreed to, and the Historic Environment Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> the next question is amendment number 11386.1, in the name of Gavin Brown which seeks to amend motion number 11386 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Town Centre Action Plan be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. Amendment number 11386.1 in the name of Gavin Brown is as follows. Yes, 12. No, 96. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11386 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Town Centre Action Plan be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11380 in the name of Nicholas Sturgeon on the de deregulation bill, UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10756, in the name of John Swinney, on the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Bill, UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. Yes.